Uh, good evening. Uh, this is the second in our uh, session of the overview of the uh, the story uh, in the scripture, Old Testament and New Testament. There, there are a number of threads that go throughout those 66 uh, books or that are very, very strongly recurring threads that are important for us to understand the story of the Bible, therefore the story of uh, Christianity, therefore the story of the church. Um, the first session, uh, we uh, we talked through what's what's commonly referred to as the time of the patriarchs. We didn't quite get to the end. That's where we're, we're going to start today. Um, we're not going to go into as much detail. I'm going to do a real quick overview of what we talked about last week. But if you want to go more deeply into that, please go to the to the YouTube um, um, recording from last week. Um, and uh, it's on the website, the church website. Uh, you can just click on that and get the whole session from last week. But but the <clears throat> the um, important overview of the of that of that section of of scripture um, is um, <clears throat> first of all kind of a prelude, and that is to um, um, it, it is it is my contention, it is my understanding that the first uh, twelve chapters of Genesis are a prequel to the story and that the story begins with Abraham and Sarah and and <clears throat> um, we we can talk about that and we did uh, last week uh, in in more detail uh, as as questions come up but I'd like to just kind of posit that at this point that those those first chapters that cre that includes the two creation stories, Cain, uh, the the um, <clears throat> the serpent, the sin, the banishment from Eden, uh, the Cain and Abel, the flood, the Tower of Babel, uh, all of all of those stories are again what all what all characterize as a prequel. The real story is begins with Abraham and Sarah, and the the gist of the Abraham and Sarah story. Now we call these the 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 stories of the patriarchs. Mm -hmm. um, we typically and in Jewish yes, in Jewish yes. um, tradition, yeah. it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's these these are the three patriarchs. Um, as we all know, patriarchs don't make kids by themselves. Um, they're patriarchs because they're the fathers of families, and families are dependent are the, on their being women to bear the children. And that's a key role. We really should say the patriarchs and and matriarchs um, in these uh, in this story. But <clears throat> um, the 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 story is that out of the blue. God calls Abraham and Sarah and says to them, um, follow me and I will make you a great nation on a land of your own and through you all the people of the world will be blessed. And Abraham and Sarah, who are... Um, presumably comfortable in their fathers in their in their own kin um they pull up stakes literally because these are nomadic uh tent living um culture uh, a tent living culture they pull up their stakes and they move from what's mess now we under we call it mesopotamia basically Iraq today, Iraq and Syria. And they move into what we now think of as Palestine or the or the Holy Land, Israel, 
Canaan, a bunch of different ways of yeah. identifying that section, that little, that little strip of territory that we call the Holy Land. Uh, in any case, Abraham and Sarah obey God's invitation. And they have no, no basis, no proof. God hasn't done a thing to prove to them that God's promises are trustworthy. And yet they, they give up everything that they, uh, all, all of their security and follow God into a future that God has promised is going to be a future of promise it, that they would be become a great nation on a land of its own uh, and through them all the people of the world would be blessed um, as you know Abraham and Sarah are childless uh, God says despite that I'm going to make I'm going to give you a child who will be your descendant and the ancestor of this great people that I'm going to um, um, that I'm going to create out of out of you all. Um, they have a child in their very old age. Um, Sarah is close to a hundred when she uh, when she has uh, when she has Isaac. Chance for me. Imagine trying to teach teach little Isaac to ride a bike and running <laughs> behind, running behind him. <laughs> Fortunately, they didn't have bikes yet. <laughs> Any, anyway, um, they they do get they um, kind of despite all expectations, they being way old. God gives them the descendant of their own, their own flesh and blood. Um, and and that, that is the beginning of a line that then um, the, the stories, a few stories about Isaac, and then more stories about uh, his sons, uh, Jacob and Esau, and especially about Jacob. Um, Jacob, is the um is the one that is probably most more than any other of the patriarchs considered the um um the patriarch in every in every sense of the word um he was the father of 12 children 12 sons and a bunch of daughters also, uh, oh. but the daughters, um, the the daughters don't count for much. I guess is 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 the in in this storyline. Uh, but the sons become uh, later on identified as the twelve tribes of Israel, and when Israel becomes a kingdom, they divide into these twelve uh, tribes. Uh, that that are the uh, uh, supposedly the descendants of of Jacob, the the patriarch. Um, where we left things last week was Jacob. <clears throat> um, uh, Jacob is is shown in in just a number of ways to be kind of a scoundrel. Um. And he also, there's wonderful stories about how he gets taken advantage of by fellow scoundrels. And um, part, part of this storyline, I talk about threads going through, uh, going through scripture, is that these people that we, that we absolutely, you know, raise up as the the paragons. I mean, this is this is Jacob. His 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 other name is Israel. The 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 country even now that's over there in the Middle East is named for this guy Israel, um, 
and and Israel, this this great patriarch has feet of clay. Uh, later on, we may, might get to this uh, to uh, uh, today. Um, King David, who who is held up as the paragon of justice and power and righteousness and blah, 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 is a bad guy in many ways. And Moses has his faults and the scriptures share with us the humanity of these great leaders of the faith. And, and again, that kind of the thread, I think, that connects all of these is that is that uh, God doesn't like send down a um, send down a semi god to to kind of make things happen. God works through natural processes, political processes. Um, just movements of of people, um, and so it's it's God often working through means, not directly. Although as we'll 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 find when we get just a little bit farther in the story, that there that there is a a real strong sense of God zapping uh, those that that displease God. We'll get to that in a minute. I want to stop there and see if anybody has any questions. I'm not hearing, but that may be because most of you are muted. But I, um, it, unless I hear or see somebody, I'll I'll uh, I'll move on. Okay, so we've gotten through Jacob. Uh, Jacob. Um, <clears throat> kind of the, the big scene for Jacob is when he exercises really poor judgment and favors his one son, Joseph, over all his other sons. And, um, and all the other sons gang up on Joseph and, and a long, wonderful uh, story. The bottom line is they... Uh, they gang up on Joseph and they sell him into slavery in Egypt. And that's where we left it last last uh, last week. So <clears throat> the uh, Joseph, uh, who's the, the second youngest son of these 12 sons, uh, Joseph is taken into slavery in in Egypt. Uh, when he gets to Egypt, um, a um, a um, upper class, um, a, a rich man, uh, apparently buys him. A guy named Potiphar uh, buys him and brings him into his household as his household slave. And Joseph, Joseph is just good at everything. And very soon, Potiphar makes Joseph the, his chief of staff, head of his household, not head of his household, but head of head steward in his household. Um, and things are looking really, really good for, for Joseph. And then Potiphar's wife gets her eye on Joseph and um, she... Um, <clears throat> she gets him in a compromising situation, which Potiphar finds out about, I mean, witnesses for himself. She gets Joseph naked. Potiphar witnesses it and throws Joseph in prison. So this is kind of, you, you kind of thought it was a low point when Joseph was in chains as a slave going to Egypt. Now he's in a jail in Egypt. And um, pretty much seems like the end of the end of the line for him. But 
um, <clears throat> uh, and if if you've um, you probably are familiar uh, through the uh, Technicolor Dreamcoat um, the the details of this story, but it's 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 so lyrical even without the music of, of Andrew Lloyd Webber uh, and and poetic um, the and the way the story is told and the um, the the story is told that with Joseph in the uh, in the prison are two prisoners who used to be servants of the Pharaoh and they got thrown into prison and they don't know what their fate is going to be. Both of them have dreams. Um, and Joseph says, I'm not sure, but I think, I think I have the gift of, of interpreting dreams. Tell me your dream. And the, uh, the first one is, is the, the Butler. He says uh, he dreamt, that he is uh, that he's serving the Pharaoh again. And the uh, and the uh, Joseph says that dream is true in just a few days. You're going to get a reprieve and be back to serving the Pharaoh. And then the the baker says, you know, I had a dream and and, and it, uh, all of the bread that I was baking was being eaten by 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 crows and by birds. And and Joseph says, and that's what's going to happen to you also in just a few days you're going to be um you're going to be um, executed uh, by pharaoh and um <clears throat> that is in fact what happens and then once that butler has been restored to his place right next to pharaoh serving pharaoh Pharaoh starts having bad dreams and the butler says this guy that I knew in prison helped me understand my dreams maybe he can help you and Pharaoh brings this guy Joseph before Pharaoh and tells tells him the dreams that he's had and in uh he's, he's had kind of two variations on on the same theme one is uh there's a <clears throat> a whole bunch of cows in a pasture uh and they're uh they're big big fat cows and then there's another pasture with with scrawny little starving to death cows and the starving to death cows go over and eat the fat cows uh, but they're still scrawny and um, and and starving. And then the other ver version of the dream is basically the same thing with corn stalks. Um, I don't know how corn stalks eat each other, but this is this is how the dream is is uh, explained: is there are good corn stalks and there are bad corn stalks, and the bad corn stalks eat the good corn stalks. And now everything's bad. And Joseph says, um, "What your the 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 dream, the uh, understanding of the dream, is that um, there are going to be seven years of just uh, unimaginable plentiful uh, harvest, and then there's going to be seven years of Im unimaginable." drought and um and pharaoh says that makes sense uh i need somebody that i can trust who will help us use the seven good years to prepare for the seven bad years and pharaoh picks joseph to do that and eventually Joseph makes Pharaoh, I mean, the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, makes Joseph his number two guy, his chief of staff. Um, he almost adopts him uh, and makes, makes uh, Joseph his chief of staff. Joseph spends the, seven, the next seven years um, preparing the kingdom of Egypt for for famine builds huge storehouses um 
and um, when and and then after the seven wonderful years um, uh, come, then they start the the seven years where they don't have enough, and they start drawing from these stores. Um, Jacob and the other brothers are still up in Canaan in Palestine in the Holy Land. They didn't they didn't up, they didn't go down to Egypt obviously. Uh, Joseph went down to Egypt as a slave. Joseph's now number 2 in Egypt. They're up in Canaan and it's they're experiencing the famine. So they send a delegation. Jacob sends a delegation down to Egypt to see if they can get the Egyptians to sell them some grain so that they can live uh, up there in, in, uh, in Canaan. And um, again, a number, a number of wonderful um, scenes ensue, but, but the, uh, the, the bottom line is that the, that uh, jo Jacob sends 10 of his remaining 11 sons down to, to beg Pharaoh for food. Um, when they get there, it's not Pharaoh that they see, it's this number two guy. And they don't recognize him as their brother. Um, they go through one uh, wonderful shenanigans some of it's just kind of what brothers do to each other uh, in, a, in, in a very real way, uh, picking on each other. But uh, ultimately, they uh, Joseph reveals himself to them, and they have a uh, uh, um, they're they're afraid that he's going to um, now get them arrested and and. Um, you know, and, and executed. And Joseph says, no, don't you see that God, God was being faithful to God's promise, uh, even through these, uh, you know, these very, very bad times for me, uh, God was being faithful to God's promise. Um, and they have a great reunion. Uh, they go back up to Canaan, they fetch Jacob, and they bring Jacob back down to Egypt and and uh, Pharaoh is so grateful to Joseph that Pharaoh gives the this clan of Jacob, the Israelites, gives them some of the best land in Egypt. It's right mm -hmm. on the Nile River. It's right on the Delta of the Nile River. So so it's it is where today, basically where Alexandria is, but it, but it's, uh, it's land that is every year fed by the, not by the flooding of the Nile. And it gets all that silt that makes it just the best, best cropland in, in Egypt. Um, that's given to Joseph and his family as a, by the Pharaoh as a reward for Joseph's service. Um, um everybody lives seem, seemingly lives happily ever after for a while jacob dies uh joseph and the brothers form a caravan to take jacob's body uh back up into canaan and if you remember uh, uh abraham had bought just a burial a burial cave for his wife sarah and then Abraham himself was buried there. Isaac and his wife, Rebecca, were buried there. Uh, and now Joseph's body is taken back up there, and he's uh, he's buried there. Uh, Joseph or Jacob? I'm sorry, Jacob. Okay. Jacob. Um, interesting that you should, you should raise that, because um, fast forward to when the Israelites leave Egypt during the Exodus, one of the things they take with them is the mummy of Joseph. Oh. 
because Joseph, this story that we've we've just been talking about, um, at at some point, Joseph dies, and before he dies, he he makes the he makes the the Israelites promise to take his bones back to the the cave uh, in in Canaan. Um, that's that's basically where the book of Genesis ends. The book of Exodus begins with these ominous words. Something, depending on what variation or what uh, translation you're using, it's something like, and then there rose in Egypt a king, a pharaoh, who did not know Joseph. Does that make sense? There's a new king in Egypt. And he doesn't, he doesn't have any affiliation with Joseph. Um, interestingly, it is, it is, um, it's very likely that this transition between a dynasty that was, or a king that was very beholden to Joseph and a new king or a new dynasty that didn't give a hoot about whoever the heck Joseph was. For one thing, we're talking about probably a couple of hundred years interval. So hmm. this new, this new could have been by this time on the throne for, for this dynasty for 100 years or 200 years. Um, interestingly, this does coincide with when um, Egyptian uh, um, historians of, of, of Egypt tell us there was a dynastic change in Egypt. The, the pharaohs that had ruled, the dynasties that had ruled for many, many, many hundreds of years were overthrown by uh, people who came from what's now Turkey. And they, they sailed down, uh, they're called the Hyksos. They sailed down from, uh, from, the, uh, from the, the Turkey, uh, basically straight south to Egypt, and they conquered Egypt. They set themselves up as the new pharaohs. So you can see if this was a new establishment and it had taken maybe 40, 50, 60 years to get control. And then by the, by the time that Exodus opens, they've been in control for a while and they have no, they have no memory of Joseph or what Joseph did for um, for um, for for Egypt. So this new these new uh, rulers, uh, they look at the Israelites who have just over over again. We're talking about a couple of hundred years uh, since the death of Joseph. Uh, these Israelites have have absolutely multiplied into a multitude, into a nation, and they are they occupy the best land in the kingdom, and the Pharaoh says, "I don't like that situation." He says, "I want that land." And I don't want those people to be in any way a threat to, to my power. And so he, he gradually enslaves the Israelites, takes away their land, uh, makes them go to work 
um, and uh, particularly as the as the story is told, uh, make makes them make bricks. And the way they made bricks, the normal way they made bricks was to was to get clay from near the Nile um, and add a lot of straw to it to keep it to keep it together and then to mold it to use molds to make whatever size brick you want and then to leave that in the sun for days to to bake in the sun um, the israelites were put to the task of doing this presumably although we don't have any there's no mention of this the um the land was confiscated um and um the Israelites were more and more uh, put into what we would now recognize as ghettos, um, mm -hmm. uh, Jewish ghettos. Um, the Pharaoh sees that the more the, the more difficult he makes the work, the more powerful the Israelites get. And so uh, at one point he sa he says, don't stop giving them straw make make them do these bricks without the straw and it's much 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 more labor intensive to make these bricks without the straw um that happens the israelites keep on multiplying so finally he kind of does the nuclear option that that tyrants do too often and he says, um, um, from from now on, every uh, every uh, Hebrew baby uh, baby boy born is to be killed. And there's no better way to stamp out a people than to you know to to kill the kill the oncoming generation. Um, so I was just a uh, question. Go ahead. I have a question. Okay. First of all, who, who was, who was the feral at that time? Do you know? Um, it, it's, it is often associated with Ramses the second. Okay. But it's not, it's, it's not for certain. Okay. Um, they're, they're the, uh, Jewish, I mean, uh, um, Egyptian archaeology has almost nothing that supports this story. Okay, all right. So there are I there are there are a few a few little things like the change in dynasty. But for in, for instance, nowhere in the in the heat in the um, Egyptian archives. Is there any record of these plagues or the army being drowned in the sea or or anything like that? This is purely coming to us from the Hebrew tradition, the Israelite tradition. You had right, another so, question. Yeah, I do. So is this the beginning of the war or the war or, or the not the war? The fight over the land that nobody, we, how do I say this? Like the Holy Land, they bought it, over this. this. Is this the beginning of that? The, this this isn't, but we're getting very close to it. Okay. We're, 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 we're still a few generations, and we've touched on it already. The land that we're talking about is, you know, what we now know as Israel and Palestine. Right. Um, and... Um, that that is the land that God's that according to the story in Genesis um, Abraham looks over that land and God says that's the land that I'm going to give to your to your descendants right um, but but Abraham never owns that land except for the burial the burial space um, 
Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, those three generations, uh, and presumably Jacob's other sons, they, they live on the land without owning the land. They, you know, you know, essentially they're sharing the land with the, from, with the consent of the owners. Who are the owners? The Canaanites who live there. There are Canaanite tribes that live, uh, and and that they're they're only barely mentioned in this part of the narrative. But when after the Exodus, the Israelites actually move in as an army into take over this land, then they start identifying the various tribes and nations and these are subsets of canaanites like there's there there are a bunch of different canaanites these are different tribes who together own that land that the that the israelites are going to move into and that's really the beginning of the conflict that we're still we're still dealing with uh <clears throat> now go ahead mike so you mentioned that um, the the new pharaoh in Egypt, which was really Turkish, right? Uh, right. Um, they put that edict that all Hebrew boys would be killed. That kind of reminds me of you know when Jesus was born, Pharaoh sent the uh, the wise men out to to tell him where where Jesus was. Herod, is that related? Herod, Herod, did. Herod. Right. Is that is that related or is that? These are it, generations apart, right? Um, like about fifteen hundred years, yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> but 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 yes, it is. Um, it's very much, um, uh, it's very much on the mind of. I believe it's Matthew is the only gospel that has uh, has that story. But it's um, um, Matthew loves to find a connection between the old testament and what and the story of jesus that he's telling and so he makes he makes a point of making sure that there's that there's a literary connection that when you hear this story about herod uh trying to get rid of the babies that you know uh that that is that that is a we would now we would call it a meme that goes back a thousand years to the um to the slaughter of the hebrew children okay okay but other that, question that edict, that edict didn't last for 1500 that was just it was just a connection right right yeah, okay that makes sense all right thanks uh other questions at this point so, um, as uh, as the uh, as the book continues, um, the the Hebrew women are supposed to kill their their baby boys. Uh, one one woman decides to disobey, and she has a baby, and she uh, puts him in a basket, uh, puts tar around the outside of the basket, and um and puts her baby in the basket and floats him in this kind of the side pools of the nile in the reeds where she thinks he won't be seen but when the when the birth police or whatever come to <laughs> her house they're not going to find a baby and so all day the baby is floating out in the nile and at night, they, she sends her daughter, Miriam, to go out and fetch the baby, bring the baby back so that she can feed the baby, and then put the baby back out in the Nile um, for safekeeping during the day. Um, no mention of crocodiles or anything like that uh, in, in, in this story. But uh, one day, the pharaoh's daughter goes down to one of these side pools in the Nile to bathe. 
she and her servants. And she notices this basket uh, floating in the Nile. And she has her servants go get it. They bring it to her and she sees a beautiful little baby. And she says, oh, I'll take this baby. And she adopts, she takes the baby out of the water and takes the baby into the palace. Uh, and then she, she thinks, oh, somebody has to, has to nurse this baby. And it happens that Miriam, the, the sister, has been kind of in the bushes seeing all of this go on. And Miriam says, oh, I know, I know a woman who's willing to nurse your baby for you. It sounds like a Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare kind of, kind of uh, um, development. And, it, it, and I really love it. Uh, I know someone who is willing to nurse your baby for you. And so Miriam comes every day and takes her brother back to their mother to be nursed for the Pharaoh's daughter. Um, so th this goes on. Moses is raised in the palace. Um, he apparently, he apparently is aware, or some people are aware, that he is Hebrew, not ethnic Egyptian. Um, but that's, that doesn't seem to be a problem until, um, <laughs> One time when he's when he's a young adult, he see he goes out and he sees the way the Egyptians are treating the Hebrews. And again, I've talked about how they've made the slavery, you know, just almost unbearable. And he sees he sees an Egyptian overlord beating a a Hebrew or Jewish slave and uh, Moses jumps on it on the on the Egyptian and kills him and then the Hebrew slaves turn to Moses and say how do we know you're not going to do the same thing to us you're Egyptian you're Egyptian as much as you're Hebrew and Moses is afraid that he doesn't fit in in either world. And now he's he's killed an officer of the Pharaoh. So he goes into exile, self-imposed exile. Um, he goes into <clears throat> if you if you look at a map, you'll see between <clears throat> between the Holy Land and uh Excuse me. Uh, between the Holy Land and uh, Egypt, there's the Sinai Peninsula. Um, it's that big triangle of basically desert. Um, he goes into that uh, uh, into that desert, into that wilderness, to save himself from um, <clears throat> from the wrath of the uh both the the uh the pharaoh's people and the hebrew people while he's in <clears throat> while he's in uh the sinai peninsula he um uh kind of throws in his lot with a with a nomadic tribe uh sheep and goat herders that are just wandering, working their way around the Sinai. And he uh, eventually marries into that family. And um, kind of everything, everything looks okay, kind of like a soft landing. Uh, he becomes a family guy. Uh, he takes care of his father's herds. And... Um, 
uh, one day while he's out with the herds and he's up, uh, he he's out in the Sinai and he, he looks up on uh, uh, one of the more prominent mountains and there's just this light. And he gets closer and closer. He basically climbs the mountain to figure out what's causing the light. And it, I'm, I'm sure you know, he, he gets to where he can see that it's a <clears throat> it's a bush that's on fire, but it just stays on fire. It it doesn't get consumed. And he's he's very interested in that. He moves closer and a voice comes to him uh saying, Moses, don't take 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 your shoes off. Uh this is sacred land. Uh, that you are that you are treading on, and um, and the and the voice eventually, and there's this again just wonderful dramatic dialogue between the voice of God and this now kind of everyday everyday Joe Shepherd Moses guy, and. Uh, God says, I'm, I'm the God of your ancestors, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And, and I have a mission for you. And Moses says, I'm glad to meet you, but I'm not interested in any kind of mission. And God said, I don't, I don't care about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and and um and god says i'm 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 calling you here and now to be my voice to go back to egypt and to tell your stepfather is that what it is step grandfather i guess yeah. step grandfather um <clears throat> that he should liberate all these slaves that are your other relatives. And Moses says, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that job. He said, he says, uh, I've got a brother, Aaron. You should check and see if he's, see if he's busy in the next few years. Cause he's, he's a really good speaker. And Moses said, I have a speech impediment. And uh, God says, it's you that I've chosen and I'll, I'll give you what you need to be my spokesperson to, to Pharaoh. So Moses says, okay. He goes back down from the mountain, leaves his, his now in-laws and goes back to, uh, goes back to Egypt and has to convince the Hebrews, the Israelites, that he's on their side and that he's going to speak on their behalf to his in-laws or whatever. And he eventually gains their trust and then goes to goes to Pharaoh and says, God says you should let the Israelites, you should liberate the Israelites. And the Pharaoh says, who the heck is God? We've got, we've got a bunch of gods here in, here in Egypt. Which, which one of these and what power does that God have over me? I'm Pharaoh. That makes me, that makes me, the son of God, as it was understood by the Egyptians. Um, Moses Moses said, "I'm I'm speaking on behalf of the God who made promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob." And Pharaoh says, "That means nothing to me." And Jacob said, "And I'm sorry." Moses says, "God tells him what to do, what what to say." Moses says, if you don't um, release the slaves, you're going to be very sorry. And then again, talk about, 
talk about dramatic, um, just well-structured um, narrative, uh, what happens is um, <clears throat> and you've 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 heard the spiritual let my people go. Um, it 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 just it's a wonderful repetition. Um, God said or Moses says, let the Israelites go. Moses says, I will not let them go. And Moses does some dramatic gesture, usually with his rod. And something happens, like in first, uh, I don't know, this isn't necessarily the right order, but uh, first, all the water in Egypt turns to blood, right. except where the Israelites live. They still have, they still have flowing water. And when everything has turned to blood, Pharaoh is aghast. He calls Moses and he says, Tell your God to undo this plague and I'll let I'll let his people go. And uh, Moses tells God that God takes the plague away. And the next day, Pharaoh says, oh, yeah, I like this new status quo, including you guys are in slavery still. And um, I'm not going to let you go. And Moses says well then there's going to be another plague and then so the next the next one comes all of the egyptians have boils all over their body painful boils and even their cattle um and uh the pharaoh pleads with moses to take away the plague and promises to let the israelites go and as soon as the plague is removed he his heart is hardened uh, that's that's a very interesting and troubling piece of this whole story is that god appears to harden the heart of pharaoh it would be it would be fun at a future at a future bible study to to dig deeper into exactly this kind of the these these plagues and the understanding of God's um <clears throat> doing them and then withdrawing them and doing them uh, but but um in 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 each of these the Israelites are spared it only hits the Egyptians um then the whole kingdom is overcome with frogs frogs everywhere um then i think it's darkness everywhere where the egyptians live but regular light uh during the day and each again each time uh pharaoh changes his mind and um finally moses is uh, god tells moses I've got I've got one more trick up my sleeve, and um, and it's a it's it's a it's a doozy, um, and he tells he tells Moses to tell the Israelites that um, they should in uh, on a certain date upcoming, and he gives them the date. Uh, they should they should prepare a lamb and slaughter it a particular way, uh, prepare it in a particular way, um, um, gather with others. If, if a household is too small to eat a lamb by itself, then bring several households together. Um, and then there would be other ingredients for that meal that were, that were uh, specified by God that the Israelites should eat uh, at this meal. Um, they're, they're, they're to take the blood from the lamb that that is uh, that is um, um, killed, and they're to to brush the the blood of the lamb over uh, their door doorposts, the top and the bottom of their doors. 
And then that night, while they're having this meal, um, and interestingly, God, uh, God tells Moses to tell the Israelites um, to um, the, the, the term that's that used is gird your loins. And basically what that means is when you're wearing a long robe, you take the ropes to tie between your legs to turn them into pants. Oh, because okay. it's much, much easier to travel in pants than with a, with a flowing robe. So girding your loin was, uh, and men and women did it, was preparing for travel. So they were supposed to eat this meal ready to travel for some reason. And uh, there, there's, an, there's another little interesting twist in, in, in this narrative, and that is the Israelites are encouraged before this night to go to their Egyptian neighbors and borrow their best jewels and fine linens, their household treasures. And I don't know why the Egyptians would share this, but again- That makes is, no sense. No, it, it, it doesn't, but, 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 but stick, with the, stick with the drama of this. They're to go and they're to, they're to borrow this jewelry and so on from the Egyptians and have that with them as part of this feast that they're having. And while they're having this feast, God sends the angel of death to go all through Egypt. And in every household to kill the firstborn son. Ooh. Except when the angel of death comes to a house that's got the blood painted on the doorway. <laughs> when the angel of death comes to that house, the angel of death passes over that house. Thus, we have the word Passover. The angel of death passes over the houses that are marked with the blood of the lamb. Um, even the Pharaoh loses his oldest son. And this time the Pharaoh calls Moses and the whole kingdom is in is in huge, huge mourning because every household has, has lost somebody. And Pharaoh says, go, get out of here. And the people of Egypt say, don't even take time to, re to return what you borrowed. Just get the hell out of here. Take it with you. We don't care. And they and the Israelites then, led by Moses, head out, and this is where the term Exodus comes from. They head out from Egypt with the kind of vague understanding that they are going to that land that had been promised to Abraham and Sarah. What was the name of the land? Canaan. Okay. The land of the Canaanites. All right. It's probably an easier, easier way of thinking of it. the land of the Canaanites. And the Canaanites were a bunch of different tribes. They weren't, they weren't one people or one nation. Um, and as, We'll get to um, uh, next week. Um, the the Israelites um, eventually conquer each of those people to take possession of the land. Uh, although there's 
um, there's an, an there's another tradition that's equally valid in scripture that has the Israelites gradually gradually coming to power in the land that they occupied rather than conquering it. Uh, but that's that's uh, part of the story for next week. Uh, let's let's uh, stop and see if the, um, we're close to our stopping to actually a little bit over. Uh, but uh, let's see if there are questions before we close tonight. Go ahead, Mike. So did the Egyptians ever find out that Moses was actually an Israelite? Um, I, I believe that, um, I believe that that, that that was known early on. Well, it was. That, that, yeah, that he was, that, that the princess was adopting a Hebrew child. Oh, okay. okay. And I, and I, um, I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure that my memory is serving me correctly i may be picking this up from the movie about moses yeah. where he where he yeah. was wrapped where he was wrapped in a typically hebrew blanket which was oh. the giveaway gotcha. but i i don't i don't know if i i don't know if that's biblical or if that's purely <laughs> a screenwriter that came up right with that. okay did moses himself know that that he was Jewish. I mean, that he, yeah, that he was Hebrew. Yeah. Yes, because the what what made him so mad that he murdered the Egyptian was when he saw the Egyptian mistreating the Hebrew, mm -hmm. and if the Egyptian was mistreating his kin. Okay. And he was he was on behalf of his people. He killed the. Um, the Egyptian. And it's really from then on, he is identified as the leader of the Israelites right. and the spokes, the spokesperson for them. Okay. Other questions? Yep. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Um, if, uh, if you know of anybody who may be interested in joining us for round three, uh, please feel free to uh, encourage them to look at uh, session one and session two, and we can uh, kind of get a, a, a running start for uh, for next time. We've still got a lot. We've got two more sessions. We've got a lot to get through, but I, I think right. I, 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 I hope I hope you're finding the connections helpful. I get them sometimes mixed up, to be honest with you, in, you know, certain parts of things. Um, but uh, but it's interesting because um, we were talking about some of this uh, recently as part of the Sunday school lessons. I, I'm yeah. not sure just how these things are picked or I, I have no idea I just know what what Margaret tells me to she reads for me and this is what we're going to teach this week uh -huh. and so I don't know but we did talk about all these plagues and uh, you know a couple months ago and it was an interesting thing to try to explain them uh -huh. to these little kids you know and <laughs> right it's 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 very challenging and it it, it mm -hmm. just to, to me, it's just so amazing that through all the generations and generations of transmission of, of this narrative, that it hasn't been smoothed out, that it hasn't mm -hmm. been, you know, that, that it, it, it hasn't been kind of gone through so that Moses and David and some of the others are just absolutely heroic and don't show themselves to be um, sinful, um, fallible people like us. Right. Any other questions or comments? Nope. All right. Great. Good to see you all. Talk to you again soon. 
Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you.